Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist on a mission to discover how to age well and look and feel better for longer and to share my own experience and research with you. And a big part of my learning is through the interviews and discussions I have with experts and specialists on this channel, including my guests today who are both regulars. Dr. Emmeline Ashley and Dr. Chen Xu are highly experienced aesthetic specialists who also have a considerable amount of general medical expertise too. And you can find out more about them in the description below and I've included their social media links for you there too. I've come to greatly value their sensible and ethical approach and today we're going to discuss the pros and cons of one of the most popular injectables out there, hyaluronic acid filler, including some of the most common questions I get asked by viewers, such as whether things like at-home devices can affect the lifespan of filler. We'll also look into the risks versus the benefits of getting them dissolved with hyaluronidase amid anecdotal reports of complications and calls from some doctors for the risks to be further investigated. And just before we get into the discussion, a reminder that you can find out more information and advice around skincare and how to age well over on my website, honest.scot. But for now, let's hear what Dr. Emmeline and Dr. Chen have to say about hyaluronic acid filler and having it dissolved, good and bad. Okay, well, it's good to see you both again. We're going to start actually with some exciting news. Well, it's exciting news for Dr. Emmeline and it's really bad news for me, okay? Because she's she's leaving Edinburgh soon. Dr. Emmeline, why don't you tell us? And I'll just try to smile like that. <laughs> so it's, it is really exciting. Um, I was headhunted by a clinic in the Cayman Islands and I've just been offered this amazing opportunity to um, run a clinic there uh, for a few years. So um, as much as I love Edinburgh and the UK, uh, my husband Jacob and I were talking about it and we just thought, you know what, we've not got kids yet. This is our opportunity. We're going to go live our best lives in the Caribbean for a little while and, and just see where life takes us. We will be back. Um, but we're we're doing the move in, uh, well, I'm actually out there next week, um, but in a couple months, we'll do the official full move. So it is exciting, but it is very bittersweet because I'm going to miss everyone I work with here and I'm going to miss all my patients too. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, Congratulations. <laughs> I know, it is. It's brilliant news. Selfishly, I'm like, oh no, but um, I'm really pleased for you. That's such an opportunity. And we've figured out those six hours time difference. So we think we can still link up and do these yeah. chats. It will be yeah. international then. Yes, we're, yeah, very international. We're going international. <laughs> <laughs> Taking it to the Cayman Islands. Exactly. Brilliant news. So we are talking about um, hyaluronic acid fillers today. And um, ironically, because Dr. Emily's leaving, I took the opportunity just a few hours ago while I had the chance before she goes to have a little hyaluronic acid filler myself in my temples to see if that would just give me a tiny little lift at the corner of my eyes. And you only put a teeny amount in, didn't you, Dr. Emily? Teeniest amount. Just keep it very natural. Just respect the anatomy. But I think you, I mean, you always look fabulous anyway, but. I had to say that. And, and you know what, I mean, you're a pro, so I wouldn't have expected anything else, but it was so super easy and it's, it's just a little bit of a refresher. Um, and, and I think I look just that bit brighter than I did. I took a little before shot before I went in and a little after shot when I came home and you can definitely see the difference. So I'll have that on screen. You two can inspect that later and see what you think. I tell you, I wanted to start with a wee funny story actually about what took me in to Dr. Emily and apart from the fact that she's going I thought I better do this now because it's now or never. Um, just at the end of last week I was in seeing an eye consultant and this came around because over the summer I've been getting really big problems with my eyes like swelling up, you know, off to the emergency doctor because I have, have an eye out to here. And it turned out to be blepharitis, probably kicked off by allergies um, but my dry eyes not helping and I had that twice and on the second visit when I went to see my own doctor about it um, I said to her that I had read that dry eyes can be exacerbated by um, hooded sagging lids you're gonna you know where this is going now <laughs> Dr Chen's like I know what you've been up to so I said to her 
I've got health insurance. I wonder if you could refer me to go and see an eye consultant and I could just ask them about this. So off I went, uh, it took me an hour to cross town, went to see this eye consultant and I was showing him pictures of me with my eyes out here. I was thinking this is going to get him on board. And he was like, oh, that's just allergies. Everything I showed him, look at this dermatitis from my sagging lane. Oh, that happens all the time. I was thinking this really isn't going well. So, I mean, when it boiled down to it, I was like, so are you basically saying there's no medical case for me to get eyelid surgery? And he said, yes, there's no medical case, but there's a very clear cosmetic case, right? And then he took his mobile phone and started taking pictures of me. And then he said, right, hold it right there. He got his hand and he went like this and took another picture of me. He showed me the before picture where I was like, and he went, see how your hooded lids are very masculinating, isn't it? And I was like, wow, where are we going here? And then he showed me the picture where I was like that. And he said, you see how much more feminine that looks? I just thought, no, do you know what? I said, thank you very much. I'll be off now. But um, yeah, that was what took me to see Dr. Emily because I thought, oh, there must be a better way just to get a little something rather than going the whole hog. And that was the thing you said to me is you you were like, my hood, because I've got hooded eyes as well. And you're like, they don't bother me. Like they're not, and mine don't bother me either, you know. No. Obviously, as you get older, they start to sag a little. And then that that's where you're really, that's where I have to put the work in to just try and keep them lifted as much as possible but I don't want to change how I look it's who I am and if it's masculine so be it anyway that was just my little story about what took me in for hyaluronic acid filler and what can be done because that's exactly what we're talking about today so um Dr Emily can you kick us off just by explaining for those who don't know exactly what hyaluronic acid filler is what it does and why it's emerged as the most widely used in the business so the way I describe hyaluronic acid filler to my patients is um, hyaluronic acid, it's a polysaccharide sugar. So it's a glycosaminoglycan that exists naturally in our tissues. It forms a big part of the extracellular matrix. So it's part of the tissue support um, architecture and hydration in our skin. So hyaluronic acid has been developed now um, as a filler. It is cross-linked into a soft gel. And depending on where you're using it and what you're trying to achieve with it, the gel has different consistencies. So for example, if we were doing a bit of cheek filler, jawline filler, we're putting the gel closer to the bone. So it's a little bit harder because we're trying to replace structure and volume. Whereas if you're doing something like a lip filler, you want it to stay very soft and very natural. And so it's, it's um, it's not quite the same consistency as you know the filler that you'd use in your cheek or in your chin um with, because hyaluronic acid is a substance that's natural to our own bodies we also naturally contain enzymes that break it down and that whole degradation and resynthesis process with hyaluronic acid is it's just part and parcel of our natural physiology so what that means is these fillers are purposely formulated and cross-linked to last, you know, as long as possible, ideally, but they are temporary. So they're not permanent, um, which makes them safer to inject for various reasons. Also means they can be dissolved in the case of an emergency because, because we have a prescription product, an enzyme that can then be used to dissolve the filler. So there are multiple systematic reviews that have demonstrated that hyaluronic acid dermal fillers are both safe and effective. Um, there are other materials and types of filler. Um, in general, hyaluronic acid is kind of the gold standard because of that reversibility and that, you know, the, the ability to reverse them in emergency situations. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are older types of fillers that we don't really use anymore. So in the past, we might have injected things like collagen or silicone, even paraffin wax in the 19th century. Um, and we did discuss on a different um, conversation about, you know, stimulatory fillers, semi-permanent fillers like Sculptra, and also why they're not necessarily the safest option. So at the moment, generally, when we talk fillers, hyaluronic acid is kind of the gold standard and what you would usually expect 
to have injected if you were going to go to a cosmetic clinic. And Dr. Chen, I mean, I know you've said before um, that it's your favourite to use in clinic. I mean, why? So in terms of dermal filler, I don't use any other material other than hyaluronic acid. So it's not even, you know, that it's my favourite. It's the only thing that I would okay. use. We don't actually use those other types of fillers anymore, like collagen when they used to inject. Um, some people actually still ask about it from time to time. But for, for years now, we've not used collagen as a filler. Um, and those semi-permanent fillers um, as sort of tissue stimulators I don't use because I can't control them um, very well and they different people react differently to them. And hyaluronic acid generally is safer to use because they can be dissolved if it were to go wrong. And, you know, as careful as we can be, um, the procedures that we do still carry risks and sometimes things can go wrong. Um, or if things don't go wrong in an emergency sense, you know, for, a, for that individual, if they don't really don't like the result, then there is an option that it, that it can be dissolved um, and reversed, you know, rather than them left feeling like their face is disfigured, you know, which which can be um, sometimes even more upsetting than actually something going wrong. And, and also the hyaluronic acid filler, um, they, they come in different sort of um, different types as in different stiffness you know you can use slightly different products for different parts of the face mm -hmm. um, they can be softer more natural looking they can be stiffer and give um, better kind of structural support yeah. and also they've been around for many years and the safety profile has been proven I mean I know occasionally there have been some issues with it but on the whole I would say they are very safe um, and I mean these Pictures, I must say, from from years gone by, but um, I don't know if if Dr. Emily knew. Remember, there was an um, an actress here called Les Leslie Ash, who I mean, she spoke publicly of um, filler. Now that was a that was permanent. I don't know what that was, whether it was silicone or what it was, but hardened in her face and that's something these are scare stories that you see on tv shows like botched and so on where people get this filler and i think that people at home can sometimes get confused and they just think filler is filler you know what were those kind of substances that people were using so i think in the past collagen um fillers you know they didn't have that reversibility of hyaluronic acid fillers i think the other problem that you have in the uk is this lack of regulation where you have non-medical professionals injecting people mm -hmm. and because they might not necessarily have access to what i would think of as very safe you know fda approved very well researched filler brands there are I mean, there are hundreds of filler brands floating around out there. There are brands of filler you can get for like 20 pounds. And I actually, I'm, I don't know what could possibly be in that formulation that would be that cheap that you would want to be injecting in someone's face. But um, the whole field of cosmetic medicine in a lot of ways is very new. And if we even go a few years, 20, 30 years into the past, um, there was, again, that same lack of regulation, but also that lack of data around things that were being used. Um, and, and things did go wrong, as they do in any um, medical specialty in its infancy. And so people do have this negative connotation around filler. So I think the thing to emphasize now is that the, the filler brands that medical professionals use are really, really safe. They have a really, really good track record. And in the hands of someone who's ethical and knows what they're doing, you're not going to get, you know, anything that's disfiguring or yeah. overfilled. I mean, on the brands, is there a particular one, you know, that people should be asking for or there, there's a better or um, brands that you prefer to use? The big brands um, that you would probably see in most clinics and, uh, you know, everyone's got their own preferences. Sometimes it depends on what you trained with initially, mm -hmm. but you've got um, Allergan. They're the makers of Botox. Um, so they do Juvederm, uh, Galderma. They do Restylane, those fillers, Tiasol, Tioxane, uh, Mertz Aesthetics do um, Bolotero, but yeah, those those are kind of the big ones and you have other things like um stylage devivacy so there are there are a few key names in in fillers what did you use on me today i used um juvederm the thing is i i would say to anyone ask what's being injected into your face question it say what is the brand you're using why are you using it what's their safety record 
like those are very legitimate questions to ask if someone's putting a substance into your face mm. and they should be able to answer that really, really confidently. And Dr. Chen, do you have a favorite? So I trained with Bella Tero um, by Mertz. So I do tend to use that quite a lot, but I have access to all the different brands. Um, Juvederm I also love as well. It's just very easy to use. Um, I tend to stick with either Juvederm or Bella Tero for most of the, most of my, my patients, but yeah. uh, if someone particularly but if i do a tear trough treatment then it's the um tear trough um it's a tear cell redensity 2 which is the one that's licensed for the tear trough area um but other than that everything else it kind of depends on um if someone has a preference for a filler particular brand brand i'll try to get that otherwise i'll use what i would prefer you mentioned tear troughs obviously i had um some filler in my temple today um Dr. Chen, there are some quite surprising things that filler can be used for. I mean, people traditionally think of it being used um, around the cheekbones or around the mouth or in the lips. You've seen people getting um, nose jobs with filler. What are some of its more surprising uses that you've you've heard about? <laughs> I guess because I've been doing it for so long, it's not really a surprise to me. Mm. Um, but in one of the clinics that I work in in central London, it's a lot of the clientele is um, Asians, Chinese, and mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of um, non-surgical rhinoplasty. So basically using a dermal filler to enhance the, the nose, the height of the nose, or sometimes correcting bumps, um, just kind of straightening. I mean, these are very subtle tweaks. I, I don't do anything really drastic, mm -hmm. um, but it does just give a very subtle enhancement. And actually chin filler is something that I also do quite a lot of, sometimes at the same time as a nose, just to kind of keep everything balanced. But over the years, the way that I approach it has ten tended to become kind of the deeper areas. I actually don't really treat superficial areas anymore really with filler other than lips. And the reason for that is I think in the past, I've seen lots of people who have had all these, you know, we, when we used to treat nasal labial folds, we used to just fill directly under yeah. the fold. That was how I was trained 11 years ago. Um, and then what happened, I, you know, in those clients that were treated, this the skin has just kind of thickened, thickened up, stiffened mm -hmm. up, and then they don't have this natural fold no. anymore and it just it can become you know can look very very odd um and i don't like it at all and once it becomes like that it's not reversible so those are i guess undesirable um, why is it not reversible would it it would it would go eventually as the filler kind of wore off would it or so is those that... kind of changes um often happen because having the filler there under the skin can actually stimulate your own um soft tissue to to kind of um, change and to become more like fibrotic tissue which is essentially sort of like scar scar tissue that doesn't really break down and it's a bit stiffer than than your normal skin would be so in terms of preventing the the fold and the lines the wrinkles um it, you know the, the skin won't wrinkle as much won't fold as much but it also won't fold normally so yeah a bit odd looking so I stopped doing that years ago and, and now most of the filler treatments I do tend to be deeper treatments where it's um, supporting the bone structure so it, it looks very natural. Interesting um, and I mean are there any other risks with hyaluronic acid filler I know you think it's one of the lower risk options which is why you use it but what can go wrong? I mean, the biggest um, potential risk for dermal filler treatment is vascular occlusion. Um, and then second to that is infection. So vascular occlusion is where it's injected into a vein or artery? Vascular occlusion is where a bit of the filler is accidentally injected into either a vein or artery, but usually the, the biggest problems comes from um, a bit of filler Inje being injected into an artery and around the sort of eye nose area where so those arteries actually connect with the arteries in the the back of the eye and all the and the brain as well. Um, it, it can be a, it, it is a high highly risky area. So if a bit of the filler goes into that artery, potentially traveling to the artery that supplies the back of the eye, it can cause blindness. You know, it's very scary when we talk about it. Um, it although it's rare, it has happened in the past. Um, so that is why we have to approach these treatments really carefully with a tear trough area, with nose filler, you know, using um, a cannula for injection can reduce some of the risk, but also just knowing the anatomy, being gentle, not injecting too much. 
Um, the lips is another area that that we um, tend to see a lot of vascular occlusions, um, just because it that that area is treated a lot. Um, so, but also in the lips, other than having the filler being injected into the uh, blood vessel. Another possibility is an area being overfilled, like the lips, for example, it can be overfilled and actually the filler is pressing on the veins or artery from the outside. Um, and the, the lip then is lacking blood supply because of um, external compression. So that's also uh, not safe either. Dr. Emily, it goes, goes without saying, I mean, that's why it's so important that people see a medical professional because it could be much cheaper to go to that someone down the lane. <laughs> who um, is, is willing to just put an, an injection in but doesn't have the knowledge of the anatomy. And you spend a lot of time today looking for where my veins and arteries were so that you missed them. Thank you for missing them. <laughs> I, you were asking me, like, you've marked up so many different bits of my face, but you're only yeah. injecting in one area. And you're like, what are you marking up? And I was like, well, all the anatom anatomical landmarks to make sure I'm safe. Um, and I think that it's an important point to emphasize, like, I do understand that these treatments, um, you know, they can be expensive. And sometimes people think, oh, if this is offered more cheaply elsewhere, then that's better or more affordable. But I cannot tell you the number of people who have had to come to the clinic where I work um, because they have had lots of complications from someone who wasn't medically qualified and it ends up costing them a lot more. And at the end of the day, when it comes to your face and your health, you really don't want to cut corners. Um, you know, if you go to a medical professional, the, the way I always explain vascular occlusion to my patients is... Um, it is a risk and it's a known risk and look, complications can happen to anyone. And I will not stand here and say it would never happen to me because I'm so incredible. Like, of course, that's not true. If you practice long enough, you will get a complication. What's more important is your ability to minimize the risk and to manage a complication. So the risk is minimized when you go to a medical professional because they really know the anatomy. Um, very importantly, they have access to the prescription medications that can adequately manage any complication that you have. So the whether it is hyaluronidase, which I know we'll discuss in a little bit, but that is a prescription only medicine. So if you are not a, you know, doctor, dentist, prescribing nurse, prescribing pharmacist, you can't legally get that medication. Um, or if you get something like an infection, as Tian mentioned, um, again, those are managed with antibiotics, potentially steroids, depending on what's going on. These are all medications and they need to be safely prescribed from someone who, um, you know, is able to take an med adequate medical history um, and get you the appropriate management plan in place if a complication were to happen. So going to a medical professional, it's, you know, it's about that follow-up and it's also about the accountability, you know, yeah. about your safety and your health. And there's no and pricey people on that. Definitely. And and presumably in the States, although it's not legal, uh, I believe, to to have a non-medical injector. Yeah, but it's criminal. It's a criminal offence. You will yeah. be arrested for practicing medicine without a medical license. Yeah, Whereas in not this country, it. it's not illegal technically. So, you know. Crazy. OK, not that long ago, there was um, a British journalist who had an MRI on her face. She'd been having hyaluronic acid filler for 20 years and she got an MRI uh, on her face to see if there was anything left in there and uh, turned out she had about 35 milliliters worth still hanging around um, after 20 years. I mean, Dr. Chen, what, what's your take? Was that surprising to you to know that some of it could last that long? Well, yes and no. Um, if it mm -hmm. was quite a few years ago um, that she had those treatments, uh, it depends on what brand of filler that she used back then. Um, it, they may have been brands that kind of did, uh, that weren't broken down properly or completely by the body that may have hang around. Um, but the other thing to uh, that I wonder is, you know, an MRI scan is amazing. It can pick up so many things, but it doesn't necessarily um, confirm that what it's picking up is actually hyaluronic acid or if it is scar tissue or if it's something else just soft tissue that it, it may just I mean all you can see on the MRI scan is these are the areas of tissue that looks different to the normal face 
um the whoever's in that article has said this it looks like 35 mils of dermal filler but i don't know how they can say that is definitely dermal filler i think that that is the main thing is that i mean looking at her face she she looks great i think for you know for her age considering how much she's had done she's yeah. basically herself as a guinea pig <laughs> to try yeah. out <laughs> all the different treatments but she's still managed to keep it quite natural looking um yeah, that's great so I think looking at that article to say, oh, there are all this filler hanging around in the face, 35 mils of it. Um, and it, it it can sound quite scary, but actually if you look at how she looks from the outside, she looks very natural. She doesn't look fake or stiff or, you know, I, I think that just shows that if you do things right and bit by bit, it, of course it will give um, some it will lead to some changes in the face or maybe some are long lasting but that may not be a bad thing if done if the treatment was done correctly in the first place dr emily what was what was your thoughts on that i think it's it's worth noting that the journalist herself was like she wasn't unhappy that she still had all that filler in her. she got her money's worth it looks fantastic um i've still got all the structure and volume in my face um you know, the, that number 35 mils was mentioned and she said herself she'd never even had 35 mils in the first place. So to me, that's a bit red flaggy, like that doesn't really make sense. Um, and as Dr. Chen has already said, you know, MRI, in terms of specifically assessing filler, it's a very niche and very new field. Mm -hmm. um, filler attracts a lot of water. So I've, I uh, saw in the article that one radiologist commented, well, that might make it look like there's more volume on the scan than there actually is. Um, also, you know, there's the chance that filler has integrated with the facial tissue. So there's a slight difference in those tissues and that's being picked up as pure filler, but it's not actually just the filler. Um, so I think, you know, I think it was a very, it was a great headline and very attention grabbing, yeah. but not necessarily the full or accurate picture. Um, I know there was a series of case reports, I think from Australia, maybe like 12 or so patients who had um, specifically been investigated with MRI because they felt like filler treatments they had had um, up to six or 12 years previously were still around. And the MRI seemed to suggest that they were. Um, but again, that is a really, really tiny sample size. Now, that's not to say that it's impossible for filler to stick around that long, because it is probably possible that filler can stick around that long. Um, but when you have, you know, little case reports and, and studies with small sample sizes, you can't extrapolate those findings to the general population and say, oh, that means if you get filler, it will be there for the next 20 years. Um, the people that were in that study, that was a self-selected group of people that came forward specifically saying that they thought the filler was hanging around. So there might, you know, there are other confounding factors potentially at play there. Um, and again, that's not to say that there's not a lot more that we need to understand about factors that could contribute to filler longevity in patients. Dr. Chen, are you completely confident that having hyaluronic acid in your face through a filler and now that we know there is a potential of it hanging around for some time do you think it's completely safe do you have any niggles about that so being a medic i can never say 100 percent everything is 100 percent safe um but i believe it i believe in it enough for myself to have a couple of filler treatments over the last few years um i think that well for me that says a lot if i'm mm -hmm. yeah have a treatment myself I, I have to believe in it and I have to um trust that it's going to be safe if it hangs around for a bit um longer than we expect I personally don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for especially since um as I mentioned earlier my approach now is more about treating the deeper layers of the face um more about supporting the the structure of the bone the the, um, the bony structure as the face ages replacing volume that's been lost um re replacing bone that that kind of um, becomes smaller with age as well so those areas if the filler does hang around for a bit longer or if it stimulates some kind of uh, fibrotic tissue um and that sticks around for a bit longer. I think that actually helps the face to hold the structure better for longer rather than okay. it having 
a negative impact. Whereas if that filler was injected too superficially, which I've seen, um, you know, some people have done in the past in the cheek area, for example, if it's done too superficially, it can be like these two lumps that kind of hang around and sometimes it can plop down and that's not very nice at all. Um, you know, but if it's small bounce done in the, in the right places um, for the right person, I think the fact that it, it can last a long time is not a bad thing and it probably is a good thing. Now we're going to look at the, the reverse because um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about um, hyaluronidase filler. Did I say that right? Um, Dr. Emily, can I kick off with you first and just explain, you know, what it is and how it works, basically? Yeah. So hyaluronidase is an enzyme and it breaks down hyaluronic acid. Um, I think a really important point to make is that it has been used in medicine since 1949 and it has a huge range of clinical applications because it can be helpful in dispersing and absorbing um, different fluids and medications. Uh, it increases capillary and tissue permeability. So we have like 70 plus years of clinical data on it and its safety. Now, it also functions specifically to break down complex um, glycosaminoglycan polysaccharides like cross-linked hyaluronic acid, which is what filler is made of. So um, we use it off license as cosmetic clinicians specifically to break down hyaluronic acid filler. Um, but again, I think it's really important to note that in a medical, purely medical clinical context, it is used in extremely high doses hundreds of times higher than we would use it cosmetically to um, either electively or emergently dissolve filler and um, in ways that's more invasive, invasive as in we administer IV. And again, that's been done safely for 70 plus years. Um, and in the UK, it's also a prescription only medication. And is that what you use in emergency then? So somebody injects filler into an artery, that's what you would get in quickly? Yeah, yeah. and it works, it works very quickly, very effectively. Um, and, you know, we've got, as always, emergency protocols, um, but that is the main prescription medication we would use in emergency situation if we were worried about vascular occlusion to dissolve the filler. Um, it can also be used electively, but I um, would say, and I think any clinician would say when it comes to any prescription medication, you know, you should never use it casually. So I don't think um, either Dr. Chen or myself would ever subscribe to the idea that, oh, we'll just pop a little filler in. And if you don't like it, we'll dissolve it out. Like the idea is that you should not be using hyaluronidase unless it's really, really strictly necessary. And I think sometimes maybe that's where um, we can get into trouble with hyaluronidase because any medication will have potential side effects and complications. And ideally, if you've had a thorough consultation with the patient and you're both on board with your treatment plan and you've managed expectations and you know what the outcome is, we shouldn't really be putting filler in someone that they're going to be so upset with that they want it dissolved electively. If, if a patient said to you, look, I'm really unhappy, I feel like I've been overfilled, you would you would think about it in that scenario, basically. Yeah, if they're unhappy and distressed, of course, I'll talk them through risks of dissolving, but we would dissolve. But I'd have to look, if I was the one who'd done the treatment, I'd have to look at myself and say, well, what, where have our expectations or, you know, our plans mismatched where I've overfilled them or I've clearly not listened to them enough where they're not happy with the outcome. Um, so that that's what I meant is that you should, you know, ideally, if you've done things correctly, you should hopefully be able to avoid that situation. But it does happen. Yeah, and of course, sure. if someone wants something dissolved, we would do that. Dr. Chen, um, Dr. Emily mentioned risks there. Um, could you talk us through the risks? And I'm thinking in particular about, you know, we've had instances where patients have complained about life changing side effects from hyaluronidase filler um, dissolver, including pain, facial drooping. There have been doctors calling for further scrutiny of the risks. So what do you think they are? So risks of hyaluronidase, um, it, some, some people can develop allergic reactions to it. And even if it's not on the first time that it's being used, subsequent, quite, subsequent times that it's being used, people can 
um, develop allergies to it. So that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, if, if you don't really need it, just don't have it because you don't want to keep on exposing your body to something that you don't really need. If you have a treatment done by someone and you have it dissolved with someone else, then that second person dissolving doesn't know where the hyaluronic acid was injected. You know, this is one of my the biggest issues I have with someone else coming to me to say, oh, I had this filler done at this other clinic and um, I don't like it. Can you please dissolve it? I don't like to dissolve other people's work because I don't know what filler they had they were that were used. Um, I don't know where exactly they've injected and how much. So if I'm trying to dissolve that filler um, and I'm randomly injecting hyaluronidase in their faces, it's not ideal because don't forget hyalur hyaluronidase can also dissolve your normal hyaluronic acid as well to some extent um, and potentially could reduce the volume in that area, you know, even more than it was before, potentially. So the, these are the kind of risks that you, you don't really want to take those risks unless it's an emergency situation. Um, I'm not quite sure about those uh, kind of things like chronic pain and unless in the injection process, if a, if a nerve was hit, potentially, if the injection was too deep. Um, but I feel like those are not necessarily related to the hyaluronidase itself, possibly the injection process. And, and Dr. Emeline, is that is that your experience as well? Yeah, I think if you look at the literature, the um, biggest risks associated with hyaluronidase are, as Dr. Chen said, they're allergic reactions that can be specifically pinpointed to being caused by the medication itself. Um, and as she said, there there are people that do feel like, um, you know, they've, they've lost volume post uh, dissolving um, because there probably is a bit of degradation of the natural hyaluronic acid but again our body's really good at regenerating it so the consensus is that that isn't permanent um, but again in terms of other potential complications like chronic pain and I'm not dismissing patients who've experienced those sorts of things like they're very real things um, it's very hard to specifically relate that to oh it must have been the hyaluronidase um because you know every scientist's catchphrase is correlation doesn't mean causation but um as i said before we've used this drug in much higher doses also intravenously for over 70 years and not had any issues with it so it's more likely probably something else or maybe something secondary to the injection as dr chan said um not the hyaluronidase itself Lastly, and I should have asked this earlier on, even for my own benefit, I mean, when you first get a uh, filler put in, in this day and age, today's modern fillers um, with hyaluronic acid, how long should it last? About 18 months? Um, it depends on which product is being used. Um, so if we're talking about the, the Juvederm brand, for example, there are the Asking soft for a friend. <laughs> So the softer ones that's designed to be used in the lips, um, generally the manufacturers would quote would last about three months or so, three, four months, up to six months. Um, in reality, patients might report that they um, wear off sooner or, or later than that. You know, there is that that natural variability um, between individuals. Um, that also depends on other factors as well. And then you've got sort of your medium thickness filler that can last six to nine months. And then you've got your your um, more stiffer filler or more cross-linked filler that can last for about a year. And in the Juvederm brand, there are some that can even last two years, apparently, because because of how it's cross-linked and how it can still stay quite soft. Okay. Um, so these vary quite a lot across different brands, across the different products within the brand. Um, so it's very difficult to say how long exactly you have. It's, it's filler specific, the product specific, and also individual specific as well. Well, at this rate, I'm thinking maybe it'll last till Dr. Emeline's back from the Cayman Islands. <laughs> and I'll, I'll be sitting on your doorstep when you get back. So the, the temple area, generally, it does last a bit longer than other areas like the lips, for example, because you don't really move that area. And it's usually in the lips um, because you're talking, you're sometimes you might be, you know, doing <laughs> putting lipstick on, you know, you're kind of subconsciously massaging or squeezing the areas quite a lot. And, and that's that what can speed up the breakdown of the filler as well. So they don't tend to last very long. But in areas that are less mobile, um, they do tend to last quite a long time. 
Well, that actually, I get asked uh, this a lot in the comments. I, I never really know what to say, not, not being an um, aesthetic uh, doctor. Uh, I'll, I'll put this one to you, Dr. Emeline. Does using things like microcurrent then, um, derma rollers, all the rest of it, would you think that might break up the, the filler uh, more quickly? So if you want it to last, stay away from your filled areas. Um, I think potentially any mechanical stimulation or massage or anything that could physically break down the filler could contribute to it. Um, what we tend to tell patients is, you know, if you, um, if lifestyle things, like if you are really into your exercise, you've got really high metabolism, if you're a smoker, things like that, they can all affect it. So even though we probably don't have a very solid evidence base yet, because there are so many factors that go into this, um, I would say, yes, avoid those things in any field okay. area. I'll keep my microcurrent away from my temples. Yes. <laughs> Just to add on that, just generally with energy based devices, like we've mentioned our therapy in the past and even thermage or any, you know, any any treatment that puts energy into the skin or deeper into the skin has that potential to break down filler and even break down fat if it's um, uh, yeah. if the energy is high enough. So just bear those in mind. And, and usually when I plan a course of treatments, if I'm doing combination treatments, I would make sure that I do all the skin tightening and those energy based devices first get the skin to um, the, the best condition and then reassess and then do the filler last. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, fantastic. Next time we see Dr. Emmeline, she may very well be in the Cayman Islands and we will expect a full report. And don't dare sit next to a window with bright sunshine behind you while we're sitting in a British winter. Oh, we'll have to speak to you with the camera off next time, I think. Have see a great you. time. <laughs> yeah, have a good one. Thank you. So another enlightening discussion there with the two doctors. I'd love to know your thoughts on what you've heard today and also your experience with either fillers or getting them dissolved. My particular takeaway that I wasn't aware of before is that by injecting in the deeper layers of the face along the bone, as happens now, rather than superficially as was the way before, that the hyaluronic acid filler could potentially support the bone structure as we age by stimulating our connective tissue fascinating stuff. I'll be back next week to share in a bit more detail the result of having a little filler in my temples to give some structural support to my eyelids and I'll look at some of the other non-surgical options for lifting eyelids too. If you want to see more from me don't forget to hit the subscription button along with the notification bell and for now thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.